Good to see you all. Uh, wow, it, like Pastor Mark was saying, this is quite a beautiful day. Welcome to all of you here and those of you tuning in live on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever's going on there, and even bless all the replay people. Amen. Amen. We are, um, this is an exciting time for us to be living in, certainly a challenging one, but still an exciting one. And one of the things I want to do today is to share a message as we conclude this uh, uh, First Peter, uh, at least talking about uh, chapter 5 today. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Mark was sharing from, uh, from chapter 4 and talking about our, our posture as it relates to suffering and knowing how to, how to do that well. Uh, last week, Pastor, Pastor Ryan shared about the Holy Spirit in his, uh, in his farewell message as they transition to a new season. But in the midst of all this, this crisis stuff going on, there's a lot of things shifting. There are a lot of things shifting. There are a lot of things that are shifting. And in the midst of a season of shifting, it's important for you to be grounded on that which is not moving. And that is the presence of God. That is the faithfulness of God. That is the activity of the Spirit of God in your own lives. In the midst of our culture today, there is a whole lot of things up in the air about what is real and what is not, what is true and what is false. In the midst of all these kinds of things, it is very, very permissible for the people in the world to wave in the wind as things blow. It is not okay for the church to wave and be moved by the same thing that moves the world. We, we've got something different to be grounded in, to be rooted in. And as we think about the Apostle Peter, who is speaking to members of the early church, he's trying to encourage them, and he's trying to, 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 to exhort them to stand firm in the midst of the situations that they're in, specifically uh, a Christian persecution because they're being Christian. And so as we look at Paul, uh, Peter's letter to those believers, the, even though we're not necessarily being persecuted uh, for our faith the same way that his original, original audience was, there are some important takeaways for us because there are some things that Peter tells us about God that we need to hang on to. There are some things that Peter tells us about how to respond to the enemy that we need to hang on to. Now, as we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, I want to dive into some of these things. And one of the things I want to talk about today is the problem with social distancing. Oh, now, oh, here we go. All right. Some people watching live like, oh, snap. Dr. John is on one today. Uh, you would be correct. You'd be correct. Now, but it's not what you think. I want to talk about the problem with social distancing. I want to talk about the problem and the challenge of developing herd immunity. Yeah, I know y'all wonder where I'm going with this. But we're going somewhere. It's very, very, very important. Because, see, as we look at the word of God, and especially with 1 Peter, the things I just mentioned to you have nothing to do with COVID-19. Nothing at all to do with COVID-19. When I was um, a young Christian, I got saved when I was, when I was seven. And my, both my parents were, were strong Christians. My dad was a pastor. I grew up learning about the word of God. I grew up being taught at home. Okay, side note, being taught at home. If you want your children to be mature Christians, teach them at home. Don't just outsource your children's spiritual education to a church's children's ministry. Okay, I, I guess I need to stay there for a minute. In our world today, if our youth are going to grow up with their roots in the word, to have strong faithfulness in the character of God, we cannot leave it up to one hour a week. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. God bless every children's pastor. 
youth pastor, youth director all across the world. They're pouring into our kids, helping them understand Bible verses, helping them understand the nature of God. But one hour a week is not going to get it. That's supposed to be a supplement to the main course throughout the week through you as parents. Children's ministry is a supplement. It's a side dish to the main course. Don't forget the main course is all I'm, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I didn't mean to get loud so early, but that's, that's just all. That's, I, I'm, I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about that. We can't just do an hour a week, and then when they get off to college, they leave high school, and then they trip, and you're like, well, how, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Once a week. An hour a week. What, what these young uh, people in ministry do, they need, it needs a supplement and argument what you're doing at home. They need to see you at home, right? You need to talk about Bible studies, at, at, have Bible studies at home and spiritual conversations at home throughout the week, and they need to be, need to be modeled, modeled by you. But my parents modeled this for me. So I grew up, I mean, VBS and, 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 and learning Bible stories and Bible scriptures and all these kinds of things. But in the midst of all that, something else crept in over the years that I was unaware of until I had a conversation slash confrontation with God. And that was the issue of pride. You know, pride is that, is that issue that nobody else has, right? No one, it, it's always other people that have a problem with pride. It's also the other issue that, that pride seems to be one of those, it, by, by nature of what pride is, it's blinding to self-assessment, self-evaluation, and accurate self-perception. Pride, just, it, you, you, you end up exalting yourself above other people, and you don't even know it. You don't even know. And I didn't even know I had a pride issue until God tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, we need, we need to talk. I'm going to talk about what? A pride issue. You know what? There's a bunch of folks that are prideful around here. I agree. We we need to, what we're going to do, God? We need to partner together and help all these people have a pride issue. You know how God, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm tapping you on the shoulder because I want to talk to you about, about, about your pride. My pride, I don't have no pride. Side note, one indication that there is pride is when you argue with God. Back to the message. I don't have a pride issue. And he talked to me about an area of my life and when he said this statement, I could not argue with him. And before I tell you what it is, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want to start at verse 5. And I'm going to, go, I'm going to read uh, fi five verses, 5 through 10, and then we're going to break each one of these apart. And then I'm going to let you in on this conversation that God had with me. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast to him. Be the power forever and ever. Amen. God opposes the proud, gives grace, favor to the humble. When I saw the verse, I, I, I knew what side of that I wanted to be on. But I didn't have a pride issue. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due time. When I talked to God, he let me in on a little secret. Uh, and, and, and I want you to use this measurement for you. He helped me diagnose an area in my heart that I didn't, where I did not know I was sick. And he pointed out an aspect of pride 
that I did not realize this aspect of pride I could, I could uh, uh, quickly admit was part of my life, but I didn't know it was connected to pride. And here is the challenge, that when we don't know these kinds of things, that issues like pride can not only be present in our hearts, but they can thrive in our hearts. They can be behind the conversations we have. They can be behind the difficulties we have in relationships and communicating. They can be behind what the, the problematic situations in our relationship with God. When we don't know these things exist in our hearts, they can thrive. And when they thrive, they sabotage all of our efforts to honor God. They sabotage all of our efforts to follow Jesus Christ. They sabotage all of our efforts to live in unity and, and love with our fellow man and woman when it's undiagnosed. And so this is what God told me. He said, because in this season of my life, this is what he said. Your prayerlessness is the biggest declaration of pride to me. Your prayerlessness is what declares your belief that you don't need my help. Dum, dum, da, dum. I lost that round. I didn't connect prayerlessness to being prideful, to, to depending on myself, my own abilities, my own capabilities, my own knowledge, my own intelligence, my own experience. I didn't connect that. But when he said prayerlessness, because there's a season in my life where I didn't pray except when I ate. I'm not talking about just as a, I'm not talking about when I was 9 and 10 years old. I'm talking about as an adult, as a Christian who's been saved for, for decades, and even as a pastor and as a chaplain, there's a season in my life where I didn't pray unless I needed to or unless I was in public. And being the wonderful father that he is, he says, John, uh, I'm not content with this. And it's in Jesus to die for you so we can have this kind of relationship. What was it behind my lack of prayer? It was the fact that even though I didn't think about it consciously, I really thought I had it together. I really thought I was able to handle things going on in my life. Until you know you run into those, those special circumstances where you're stuck and you know you need God. But the reality is, whether I'm in hard situations or not, I always have the same need for God. And that's what I had to learn. I wasn't able to make that shift until I saw the real problem I couldn't humble myself, as the word says, until I saw the need to humble myself. Until I saw the problem, I wasn't convinced I needed the solution. What does this have to do with us today and what's going on? Because in our world today and in our nation today, our nation's health in all the different ways mental, emotional, financial, our nation's health cannot afford to have a prideful, prayerless church. We get a prideful, prayerless church when it is filled with people who think they got it. A prideful, prayerless church is made up of prideful, prayerless people. One of the things that uh, since I've been known, known the rock and been connected with the rock, you guys have a passion for prayer. But is that everybody or just a few? Is it just a percentage of the whole? I'm encouraging you to look at your own spirituality. Our nation needs us. And we cannot afford to say, well, I'm glad some people at the rock are praying. I'm glad we got some intercessors who know how to get a prayer through. No, we need every soldier on the battlefield ready to fight and engaged in this thing and not to say, man, I'm, I'm having a bad day. I'm glad these other soldiers got it. Let me just go ahead and lay down. We don't have time for that. The situation is too critical. What about your prayer life? Is it 
full of vibrancy and full of, of spirituality and full of revelation from God on what to say? Or is it still missing? If it is missing, I've got a word for you. God resists the proud. I've got a word for you. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. We need God to move by his spirit in our nation. And he doesn't move by his spirit by us hoping he does something. He moves by his spirit when you pray and when I pray and the people of God pray. And the way we get to that place of prayer is understanding from a humble place, we need God. We don't got this. It ain't a matter of us just hoping the thing blows over. We've got to pray this thing through. Our nation needs us. The world needs us. We are the church. We ain't got time to be playing games. We don't have time for half of us to be fighting and the other half of us hoping that things work out. Is that a little too much too early in the morning? Oh, good, because it is what it is. Let me, let me get to this, this other piece here. Uh, when Peter says humble yourselves, he, he's not just making some, some random idea and random encouragement. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see that it was so important to God for people to humble themselves. And he had a problem when they did. In Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, Moses is talking to Pharaoh. He says, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. Jesus, in Matthew 23, 12, uh, in several different times, he teaches this. This is where Peter got it from. He teaches this. Matthew 23, 12, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 14, 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be made humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18, 14, I tell you, this man rather than the Pharisee went home justified for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In James chapter 4, verse 7, another disciple who heard the same teachings of Jesus as Peter, James echoes the same thing to his, his audience. He says in chapter 4, verse 7, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And verse, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Right now our nation needs a humble church because that's where the prayer is going to come from. That's where the power is going to come from. That's where the spirit of God is going to, going to move. That's where revival comes from, from the humility of the people of God. And so we can't get there as a group if the enemy has sabotaged our hearts privately and individually. And that's why we're calling this out, for you and me to go before God and say, God, what is the issue here? What's my role in this fight right now? What do you want me to do? And what's in my heart that's preventing me from participating in this whole thing the way you want me to participate? What's preventing me from from standing my ground? What's preventing me from saying what you want me to say, from taking the position you want me to take? What is preventing me right now in the name of Jesus? Reveal it so I can get it out and and, and, and be in alignment with you. For my plan, for your plan for my life in this season of the world's history. So then he says in verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. There's some things I wanted to say about that, but I'm going to get to this other one as we, and then we'll, then we'll, we'll close. At least we'll consider it. Here, here, uh, 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 Peter says, he says these, these things, he makes these statements, and then he, he gives you the reason why. Uh, pay attention to what he says. He goes, for example, um, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why, Peter? So he will lift you up. Verse 7, cast all your anxiety, your cares on him. Why, Peter? Because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Why, Peter? Because the enemy is trying to get who he can de- devour. Resist him and stand in faith. Why, Peter? Because you know that the entire family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. He makes these encouragements, these declarations, and then he backs it up with the rationale. And so as it relates to the enemy, he says, be alert and sober mind because your enemy, the adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. When I was a kid, I used to love, 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 and I actually still do, watching the nature programs on TV. Uh, a mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I, I, I grew up on all that. It, you know, uh, a National Geographic, all that stuff. 
And one of the things that just always struck a chord with me is how lions pursue their prey and their strategy. It's interesting here. There are a lot of prey and predator relationships, but Peter is specific to talk about the lions that go around roaring about speaking who me that he may devour. Now, he's not talking specifically about how lions hunt because when lions hunt, they don't roar. A, lion, a hunting lion that's roaring is an unsuccessful lion. Roar, I'm coming to get you. That, that's not going to work out well. His point is, pay attention to how the devil tries to intimidate. That's what the roar is about. You can hear a lion's roar two to three miles away. And when that lion roars, he's saying, I want you to know I'm here. And if you come within my range, it's going to be on today. That's why the lion roars to intimidate, to cause some kind of emotional response in a perceived threat. Or anyone who's thinking about trying to take the pride, his pride away. And so Peter says, watch out. Because the lion is going around trying to see, seeking whom he may devour. Because he knows he can't devour everything everybody. When you watch lions hunt, they hunt in a group. They hunt in a pack, in a pride. And, and their primary targets in, in, in the plains of Africa are all, let's listen, are all animals who, who move in herds. They live in herds. Zebras, herds. Wildebeest, herds. Cape buffalo, herds. All of their primary prey options move in herds. So they have to have a plan. They have to have a plan. They don't generally hunt animals that are by themselves, so they have to approach a herd and have to isolate somebody. And if you've ever seen a Cape buffalo, a Cape buffalo is a massive, ridiculously powerful creature. But no matter how powerful a Cape buffalo is, if he is by himself, a mature bull Cape buffalo surrounded by five or six lions, it's just a matter of time. Because no matter how powerful he is, it's, he's nothing by himself compared to who he is with the community. And so the strategy of the enemy is to isolate. He can't, he can't attack the whole herd. Lions don't attack the whole herd. They challenge the whole herd and see who's going to fall off. They challenge the whole herd and see if the young one gets isolated. They challenge the whole herd, and then they go after the one who is isolated or socially distanced. When you think about this whole idea of herd immunity that we have here in America concerning covid the whole idea is for enough people in the herd to develop some kind of immunity or protection against the quote-unquote attack of any kind of disease. And the whole premise is that when there are enough people in the herd who are immune, then it can actually help for those who are not immune. The stronger can impact and be the protection of the weaker. That's the idea of herd immunity. And so the same way with buffalo, the same way with zebras, the same way with, 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 with wildebeest, they understand herd immunity, the power of sticking together when the lions come. When the, when the herd is kind of separated and they're grazing and they're apart, anytime somebody identifies that there is a lion uh, in the weeds trying to get us, the herd, they come together. They come together because they understand, listen, they understand that the power of herd immunity is in the existence of herd community. And that's what Pastor Mark was trying to say before he knew what my message was all about. Herd immunity is about being in herd community. The nature of just the herd itself, it is a group of animals. But listen to me carefully. This is why this is so important. It's a group of animals, a herd a group of zebras, a group of wildebeest, a group of buffalo. That's a herd. But just because a, 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 a folks, people now, are gathered in a group, you can, you can be gathered and still not together. You and I know you can, be, you can be at work and you can say you're working together, but still not working together. Just because you sit next to each other in the same cubicle, that doesn't mean that you are on the same page. The herd community is about when the herd works together. Uh, when you cry, I cry. If there's a threat, I'm covering you because I'm stronger than you. You're weaker. You're maybe even less mature, but I got your back. Stay in the middle while those who are strong form a circle around you and protect you against the danger. That's herd immunity because of herd community. If you're not part of the herd, then you don't have the immunity because you're not in the community. And, but, and Peter is saying the devil is looking for those who are not in the community. The community is not about just being together. I mean, being gathered. 
You can, be, you can be in a group and not be together. Together is about an inside connection. Uh, it, it's about relationship. Uh, people can be, you know, just because you have uniformity where people wear the same uniform, that doesn't mean you have unity. The body of Christ is called to have unity. It's called to be together. So it's not just about gathering. It's about being on one accord. When we're on one accord, that's where we have the protection. And so, so, so how does this relate to social, social distancing? Here's the thing. I am absolutely, absolutely, absolutely against social distancing. Absolutely. And, and hear me clearly. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm saying, that, I'm saying this. The phrase social distancing, it, it, I think they use the wrong terminology to explain what they're talking about. It, it, what we're doing is not social distancing. It's physical distancing. It's physical distancing. The whole definition of it is a physical six feet apart. That's what it is, right? If you look in the dictionary, under uh, 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 look, look up social distancing in the dictionary, before the COVID crisis, redefine the terminology. Everything printed in the dictionary was already there. Miriam Webster says this, social distancing is a degree of acceptance or rejection of social interaction between individuals and especially those who belong to different social groups, such as race, ethnicity, class, or gender. Wikipedia says it's the distance between different groups in society, such as social class, race, ethnicity, gender, or sexuality. CDC says social distancing or physical distancing. That's where they put the two together. Social distancing or physical distancing, it means keeping a safe space between yourself and other people who are not from your household. That's physical distancing. Social distancing is when there's a water fountain here and a water fountain here, and one says white and the other says colored. That's social distancing. Social distancing is when I'm an introvert and I can't stand the social butterfly who wants to talk about everything all the time, and I what? Distance myself. It ain't about six feet. I don't want to be around you. I don't want relationship with you. Social means relationship. Social distancing is relational distancing. That is not what the body of Christ needs right now. I'm all for, if you want, I'm all for physical distancing. Don't hear me say don't physical. No, physical is distancing at six feet. I'm talking about social distancing. Why are you all here right now in person? And even those tuning in on Facebook, it's not about distance. It's about you want to be social. You want a social connection. And even now we're using social media. Oh, come to my house on Friday night. We're going to get together and have a social. What's it about? Relationships. We're going to connect. We're going to connect. We're going to connect. We're going to connect. Relationship, relationship. We need relationships. I'm not opposed to physical distancing, but the idea of social distancing is, is an error. We're in school. We study social studies. On Facebook, we have social media. Studying human relationships is sociology. Social, social, social. We don't do social distancing. We actually take care, uh, use, uh, take advantage of technology to increase social connection. We want to be social. When I zoom on a staff meeting, it's in, or see your face or FaceTime, it's because I want to be social. You want to be social. It's not social distancing. We use Zoom or FaceTime because of, we want physical distancing. Physical distancing, I get that, I understand it. But social distancing, social distancing is what's behind the increase in suicide rates. They're socially distanced. Social distancing is behind the increase in depression and anxiety because they're socially distant. When you want to punish someone, what do you do? You put them in social isolation as punishment. I'm saying watch out for the implications of that idea of social distancing. Again, I get physical distancing. I get looking at the risk of pa passing a disease. That's physical distancing. But don't social distance. Don't distance yourself from relationships. When the Jews hated Samaritans, that was social distancing. If I'm offended at you or you owe me money or I owe you money, I'm going to socially distance myself. I I'm going I'm to change the relationship. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Okay, now if you repeat this to somebody else, make sure you tell them the whole thing. Look, Dr. John said, no social distancing, it ain't biblical. <laughs> I understand the risk of being misunderstood. I don't care because the power of the truth is so important. We need to understand it. You can be physical distance, but don't you dare social distance. 
Don't isolate yourself. Don't be off trying to do your own thing because even the strongest Cape Buffalo will succumb by being surrounded by lions. And the lion is looking to see who will be vulnerable. And when you socially distance yourself from other relationships, you make yourself vulnerable. You isolate yourself, and the devil can have a field day with you. It's just a matter of time. Get connected and stay connected. Get connected and stay connected. If it's FaceTime, if it's virtual communities, get connected and stay connected. It's for your own mental health, your spiritual health, your emotional health. Don't look at these opportunities to get connected and decline them because the enemy your adversary is looking to see who he can devour. And so the Apostle Paul, I mean Peter, he says, I want to remind you, I know you're going through some stuff, but think about your family all around the world. Think about the relationships. Think about the community, the community. I don't care what propaganda is being said out there. I get the rationale or whatever, but you and I were created and recreated to be in a body of Christ. Our relationships are massively important to the thriving of the church, especially in a time like this. By all means, physical distance. By all means, wear your mask. But whatever you do, don't socially distance yourself from other relationships. Whatever you do, don't do that. If you have a need, call somebody. Those who are socially distant are the ones who, when they get sick, no one knows about it, and they get mad that nobody called them. We didn't know. Why? Because you socially distance yourself. You separate from the church but have high expectations of the church. Make up your mind. Do you want to be by, if you want to be by yourself, be by yourself. But don't complain when you suffer by yourself. You have every opportunity to be connected. Be connected. This is how we were made. We're designed for relationship. It's not good for man to be alone, especially in the middle of a crisis. And so... As I close this message, I just want to encourage you the same way Peter encouraged those going through Christian persecution and going through suffering. Humble yourselves. Learn to depend on God. Hear what he's saying to you. Get the personal instructions he wants to give you and your family for how he wants to navigate your family through this crisis and through these challenges. Humble yourselves and pray for yourself, for your family, for our nation, and for the world. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. And God will honor that. That's what it says. Exalt you. He will honor that. And, 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 and be, be, be vigilant. Pay attention to what's going on. Be sober-minded because your adversary, the devil, is looking to see who he may devour. Looking around this audience right now, even in Facebook, he's looking to see who he may devour. And you don't see what I see. I don't see what you see. And none of us sees what he sees when he looks at us. We don't know who he may devour. But I'll, I'll tell you what, it ain't going to be me. And as much as I can help it, I don't want it to be you. Herd community gives rise to herd immunity. So when the lion comes prowling, we say together, not today, Satan. Not today. In the name of Jesus.